Aureus Mike. A couple weeks ago you saw us unbox the iGulu F1 brew system. Today I'm going to make my first batch of beer. I've selected for this batch of beer the Pale Ale kit. Pretty straightforward Pale Ale kit. Um, we'll throw this together. Uh, I picked the Pale Ale versus the Wit or the Amber Lager because um, I figure Pale Ale is a really good way to judge any brewery I go to, any uh, new craft beer places, things like that. It's also a really great standard recipe to try and taste how well this thing produces an American pale ale. So I'm going to move some cameras around and then we will get the ingredients into the system. All right, I've gone ahead and opened up the iGulu uh, ingredient kit for the pale ale. Let's take a look at what's inside. First off is uh, one pound of CBW pale ale extract from uh, from Brace. There's this natural hops bitter extract and there are two mosaic aromatic extracts. It has their 01 dry brewing yeast. It also came with three packets of priming sugar. Not quite sure if I need those because I'm going to be using the CO2 system on the back of the iGulu. Um, we'll figure that out later. And then this is your RFID sticker, which on the front of the machine goes right here and to activate the brew. So we'll see that in a little bit. But first, uh, I got to sanitize my tank and get things ready to go. All right, here we go. So I've got my one gallon iGulu fermentation tank ready to go. I need to add some water. I'm just gonna go with my favorite spring water here because I like the way it tastes and it's super easy. You could probably go with RO. Um, if you're an extract brewer, you've been an extract brewer for a long time, you know, it's probably best to go with a very neutral water because you don't know what kind of minerals are in the extract itself. So I'm just gonna glug this up here to that one gallon mark somewhere between the 116 and the max line. That's good enough, I suppose. Show you what that looks like right there. So when it's sitting on the table, somewhere in the middle. Looks good, everybody's happy with that. Let me get this jug of water out of my way. Okay, so then the next step is to add all of these hop extracts into the brew. So I'm just gonna mix it up a little bit. Um, here goes the natural hops, the bitter extract. Let's see if we can just get this out of the way. So in goes these. Got a slight yellow color to it, which makes sense. And then the mosaic extract. I'm looking forward to seeing how much this reminds me of mosaic. Oh, look at that one. Got a little bit more depth of color to it. Smells hoppy. And the last one. Get it all out of there. Woohoo! Look at that. Okay. There's that. And then they say to put the yeast on top. Get that yeast right on top. Where are my scissors? I had pre-sanitized my scissors and my yeast packet. Oh, one yeast packet. This is two grams of yeast. Okay, yeast is in there. You wanna see it? Look at that. There's the yeast on top, looking good. Probably shouldn't be messing with the camera. Okay, now for the dry malt extract. Now, if you're totally new to extract brewing, home brewing, you gotta know one thing about dry malt extract is that it is really dry and it'll go everywhere. It's very powdery, really fine powder. So just be wary of that when you open this up. You don't wanna drop it or shake it up too much. It'll puff all over the place. See if I can put this in here without making too big of a mess and have it make sense for the camera. So this just goes right in. Nope, easy does it. Get it all in there, there we go. All right, now the instructions say that I don't need to mix this up. I'm just gonna take the the top, it has the ports on top, it's a pressure relief valve. This is the gas out, this is gas in. So I'm just gonna put that right in there. 
I'm gonna press it down and get it sealed all the way on there. Then this collar goes right on just like this to hold it all in place while it actually ferments because it will, it's gonna generate some CO2. It'll be a little bit of pressure in there. And it's not like a super snug, ridiculous type fit, but it holds it on there so you can lift it up, which is what we gotta do next. So now this has to go into the iGulu. So I'll move some cameras and we'll take a look at that. All right, I've got the iGulu over here on my countertop. It's plugged in. I showed you the power comes on. The iGulu, iGulu logo shows up. So the first things first, take this lid off. I'll drop the fermentation tank inside here. Make sure I don't have anything in there. There we go, drop that in there. Um, now the next step is to remove this magnetic cover at the top of the draft system. You simply take this hose, which I've sanitized. Let's unclench it. Pull this all the way forward. There's like a little pinch valve in there. Nothing fancy. Push it to get to the bottom. Let the handle go. And this simply goes into that one. And then this guy goes over here onto the gas in. This gets covered back up. Oh, there's two little ribs there to hold the line down. This just gets held in place magnetically. Nice clean finish. And then the lid goes on. And now all we're ready for is the RFID sticker. It shows up in the front, pale ale. I hit next. And it shows me I'm ready to go. One day at 60F, two days at 64F, three days at 68F, and then three days at 35F. So all I gotta do now is hit brew. Light changes color, which you can't see from up there. And we're off. So the next step will be to do a tasting. That's when you'll see this next. Cheers. All right. Hey, it's John and Mike, brew-shoes.com, and now we're doing the iGulu tasting video. A few videos ago, a few weeks ago, it just seems like yesterday, we were unboxing the iGulu brewing system. It's something that sits right on your cabinet or your uh, countertop, and uh, it's been sitting over there for a while. It's been making lots of interesting sounds, and this weekend, text, a message came to me from Mike that said, We've gone green, so that means we can taste beer. And I said, okay, I guess that's, that is the signal. We are ready. That, that is the beer signal. So uh, right here, what do we have in front of us? This is the pale ale? This is the yeah, pale ale kit, which is um, the bittering hops. They don't describe, but it has these little, um, let me see if I can define what. Yeah, so this is the aromatic, it's a mosaic. Oh, mosaic. So this is basically a mosaic pale ale, essentially. Okay. Um, the base malt um, is just uh, Brees L.D. Carson's uh, dry malt extract. All right. So nothing special. It doesn't say like golden extract or whatever. Sometimes this is a combination of like base malt and a little crystal six or something. Sure. But it doesn't. Just pale. I don't really. It's just pale. So, um, so yeah. So that's the deal with that. And then there was the the yeast that came with it um, too. So there's a lot of that footage. Yeah. I hope has run before this video, but. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I did some footage of the actual brew session. But pale ale, iGulu, so the iGulu system. So we, we tapped this tonight, and we weren't sure what was going to come out. <laughs> because uh, is there, was there a lack of just uh, information, instructions, or? Yeah. Tell me more. So tell me less. in all of the stuff that came with it, um, I went through all the packaging again. There are no there are no written instructions whatsoever, and I scoured the website as best as I could, and I failed to find on the website any step by step instructions. There's a couple really nicely produced videos that show essentially what I show. That's how I learned how to make the the the, the beer, uh, putting the ingredients in the mini keg and then putting it in the system. Um, but what happens once you kick off fermentation and how does the system then get to this point where you're serving uh, was, is a completely black box. I have no idea um, what was supposed to happen, how you're supposed to do it. I did hook up a, C there is CO2 in the back of it. 
Um, it's one of those um, soda stream bottles that screws in. Um, uh, side note, uh, soda stream makes two types of bottles. There's a quick connect bottle and there's a threaded bottle. There's no instructions whatsoever as to which one of those bottles you need. Mm. So I guessed, grabbed the threaded one, and that's the one that goes on the back. But when we pour this and uh, sub in pour shot here, is that um, the beer poured okay because there was a lot of pressure still in the ferment fermenter, but um, I assume it sort of sponded itself during fermentation because before it kicked over to just cooling mode, it was showing me on the front a PSI of something like, you know, 30 something PSI. So, uh, which is actually quite a bit more than what we would normally sure. serve at like sure. 12 PSI. But anyway, I just, I just figured it was going to spund itself somehow. Uh, with the final, uh, I don't know if that CO2 pressure was coming from the CO2 tank or was it actually spunding and capturing, holding back fermentation for, let's say, the last three days um, of the process. So I, I really didn't know what to expect, but it's clear to us now while we were trying to do pours that there is no CO2 flowing from the CO2 tank. Uh, in fact, I had to go into the system to use what's called the air mode. There is an air pump in the back where you can have it you can burst into the head of the keg air to help push beer out. So the beer appears to be carbonated. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We had a lot of foam when we were pouring, so it does appear that it's sort of self-spunded uh, during fermentation because I don't think the CO2 tank has actually done anything. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, so that, that it, at least it's carbonated. But now I had to use air to push it, which means it's going to stale and you have to drink the rest of this beer before you leave. <laughs> so um, it's just one gallon, so you can do it. Um, yep. Anyway, so that's that part of the process, the, the delivery process. But what do we think about the beer? Yeah, that's a different and then, um And then we can riff on whatever we've got left to talk about. Yeah, let's start with appearance. Um, the head that came off of this, and I don't know what that's a product of, but... Uh, it, it looks like an ice cream float, you know, the, the kind of... Uh, Very head. thick head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what you'd get from, like, throwing a yeah. scoop of ice cream on Which a glass of soda. Which is kind of nice. It's actually a really sticky, thick head, yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms of color, this, uh, I think, hits the mark on, yeah. you know, a hazy pale ale. Yep. You know, nice... Uh, it's, it's cloudy, yep. but, uh, you know, nice, uh, I would say, golden color. Uh, Moving on to, yeah, gold. Yeah, yep, certainly. Which is Dark interesting because it's just uh, one pound essentially of, of pale, pale extract. extract. So extract, maybe right. it is like a an English extract that's a little bit more in color. So, yep. but you don't know because it's just extract. So you don't know what that is. Um, what do you think of the aroma? What do you get in the aroma? Mm. Well, there is a tinge of, um, you know, mose. <laughs> Mosaic. Uh, there is like a like a piney, earthy. Certainly, like has hopper like a hop presence. Yep. But then there's something kind of off. Yep. Yep. It's um a little. It's sulfur. Stinky. Yeah. yeah. There's a there's a there's a hint of like a sulfur uh, in there, and maybe even a little bit of like um. um diacetyl too i think is a little bit of both yeah. there's a little bit of a um like an egg like aroma to it and there's also a hint of like dazzles and the weird thing is that that mosaic is trying to that that aromatic through it. is trying to push through it yeah. so you get this mosaic fruitiness but with this weird sulfur component and a little bit of diacetyl so there's definitely i guess in my opinion i would say that there's definitely uh, some signs of either incomplete fermentation which is where the diacetyl would really be, or a stress fermentation yeah. for sure. Uh, which is where, um, or just a weak fermentation, such that, that that sulfur component wasn't being blown off during fermentation mm. effectively. Now, if the machine was trying to spund itself during its last three or four days, it was capturing some of that, because the temperature does ramp up towards the end of the process. So where you might be getting the last few kicks of yeast activity to blow off, it, if you're spunding that, that is ending up in the beer, and you can definitely uh, smell it. Mm. And what do you think about the overall flavor of the beer? I don't think the sulfur is in the flavor. I think that um, fairly strong hoppy presence in the flavor. Mm -hmm. Would you qualify much bitterness in there? 
No, no, it's uh, very much like a, a late uh, Yeah, so there's, there was two of these extract of um, mosaic aroma, they call them ar aromatic extract. Then there was this one package of just called bitter extract, and it says bitter extract 25. I'm not sure if that's supposed to mean 25 IBUs of bitterness, which would actually be really low bitterness. So yeah. this is supposed to probably lean on that fruity, hoppy aroma forward yeah. type of pale ale without much bitterness. Yep. Nope. Because that appeals to a lot of people. I get it. I understand if that's true. That's why the recipe was put together here. But I think um, for me in the flavor too, there's still a lot of like um, malt sweetness in a way yeah. from that extract. Now extract is hard to get a complete ferment on. Um, so that like that's a <laughs> that's a thing. It might just be not fully fermented. That might explain too the really nice thick Hmm. sticky raw I mean look at how that's just sticking in I the know. glass I so <laughs> there's still maybe some extract there that hasn't fully fermented out but I can live with that a little bit of that malt sweetness with like great mosaic flavors would that amplify the fruitiness of those mosaic hops um, to try to put a, a you know I'm just I'm not it's not a stretch to put that as a positive spin on on it but um, but it does result in that um, I think on the mouth feel I get a little bit of that whether it be residual extract, but maybe a little bit of that diacetyl thing in there on the, on yeah. the mouthfeel. Yep. Yep. Uh, I am surprised that there isn't much in the way of like, Seven. it's cloudy. Now, I'll just accept that maybe it's supposed to be cloudy by design recipe wise, but there isn't a lot of stuff in there. There's not sediment. Uh, there's a dip tube that goes to the center and the bottom of that keg has like little feet or lobes on it, like the bottom of a two liter soda bottle. Mm. So what's supposed to happen then actually is as it chills and stuff settles out, it would actually go into those little feet, those lobes, and the center is risen up and that's where the dip tube sits. So it should be out of the sediment and that appears to be the case yeah. here. So, yeah. um, you know, so now I think it's over carbonated. I think that whatever it did to carbonate, because those first few pours, was just foam, all <laughs> foam, yeah. all foam. And it took us a bit playing with it to the point where then I went into the pressure relief and relieved some of that pressure yeah. and then had to um, figure that the CO2 tank would then kick in next time I poured it. It's not doing anything. So that's why I used the air to give me enough push to get some beer in here. Um, so that is that that is what it is. Um, any other comments about the beer? And then I can talk a little bit more about the process. No, I think you've nailed all the things. I just, uh, as we've discussed the uh, aroma, now that I go to this, it's almost like it's it's so, it's getting overwhelming. It is overwhelming, yeah. To the point where I, I don't want to sip anymore. And I know that I have like probably three quarters of a U.S. gallon to drink before I leave tonight. I'm not looking forward to it. But yeah. go on. Let's talk so, more um, about the process. But I do really think that the process, um, you know, you... The one gallon water extract, yeah. the little uh, you know uh, malt extract, and then the little things. Um, it's it's not a lot in the way of creativity, but if you just want to be able to make some beer and say I made some beer, this is a really cool way to get into it. I do think like the complete autopilot, the RFID. I think the RFID idea is really neat. Um, when you hit the RFID, the touch screen comes up with. It shows you it's going to be two days at this temperature, three days at this, three days, and it's you know going to ramp up. I'm not 100% sure whether or not the device itself actively heats. Mm. It's It has a compressor, and it kicks in from time to time uh, to cool. I assume that's what, what's happening with that compressor kicking is it's cooling. So there's no problem doing that. But it is a little cool down here. So um, I did watch the temperature, and it did creep up, but I wasn't always hitting the, those those target temperatures, maybe a degree or two short. And I wasn't sure if whether the, the timing of it was just going to measure three days, whether it hit that temperature or not, and then moved on to the next temperature, somehow waiting for it to go up in temperature. Um, so maybe maybe that would have resulted in a better fermentation. You know, I'm willing to accept some of the responsibility of that. But at the same time, there is no, there's no documentation around that. It's Scan the RFID, yep. put the stuff together, and it's going to do it for the machine you. Machine does but it. But if it can't heat, what what is it supposed to do if it's under temperature? So it doesn't stop itself. It doesn't give you any warnings. Um, I think the process is simple and easy. Um, kits are great. I still have the 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 lager and the Bavarian wheat, and maybe I'll throw one of those together just to try it out. Once I get a little more feedback from my Gulu, or I find some instructions or something, 
just make the machine work a little bit better. One thing you can do, which I think is neat, is you can buy multiple of those kegs. Um, I was thinking as a home brewer doing recipes, um, I could put a gallon of my own wort in there and set it to go. Use like this structure, the, the RFID card from one of these other beers that fits that profile well enough. Sure. And see how well it handles that type of, uh, where I can control the fermentability of that wort, the strength of that wort, the type of hops that are in that wort. So there's an opportunity for creativity on that end of it if you're okay with just having a one gallon. I think it's really awesome if you can actually get a really good fermentation in one gallon mm. and then it chills. This mm. has been sitting for about nine days cold. It's ready to pour. I mean, so with your own recipe in there, the machine itself has a lot of potential. I just think that I and I, Gula, we need to work through where the process did, yep. wasn't ideal for me. Um, the only other issue I'm having too, and I'm glad that you tried it too, is that the little touch screen on the front doesn't necessarily like my fingers. For some reason, I can swipe it, swipe it up, down, and it's not super responsive. It, yeah. it takes like a really focused effort to get the screen to slide over or up or down. Uh, touching it with the buttons seems to be fine, but getting it to scroll yeah. uh, is really sensitive. It's like it's a long not, press and then slow. Yeah, so, um, yeah. so, the, I'm, we're, so we're just laying this out here, yeah. right? That's yeah. This is our experience with it. Um, I still think it's got try. a lot of cool, it's the first try, it's got a lot of cool potential. Um, I, I've heard some other people complain about the, um, the volume, if you will, of the compressor. It is not super loud, but it is very deep. So it's like, <laughs> you know, it's so in a, and it tends to actually vibrate pretty uh -huh. well. So um, bottles that are on my counter or on the wall, I mean, it, they were vibrating. I just had to separate them out. So it does, I mean, it's not a completely silent operation. It, it does have a little, but that doesn't kick in until it really needs to be cooling. So um, it's the Barry White of it's the Barry White of, of compressors. Of, of hey, compressors. So, yeah. so I think it's really neat. I wish that I had a better idea of how to operate it on the first run. And believe me, I try. I tried. I mm. didn't just ram into it. I, I looked really hard. Um, of course, someone's going to go, here's the PDF right here. It was on page two, you know, but anyway, <laughs> but I, I, I really couldn't find it. Um, I had heard in one report, there's another channel out there that has done a, a handful of reviews with this system that the, that the, in, that instruction manual had been pulled down for revision. Um, but I don't have something to go by on yeah. in the meantime. So anyway, cool. cool. Well, this was a, uh, I think the iGulu was at uh, CES in Las Vegas this past uh, January. And uh, I saw a headline where someone said, I, I drank beer at CES and I got kicked out. I guess, I guess that wasn't cool with the uh, convention um, uh, staff or whatever, but that's okay. Uh, it is available and you don't have to go to CES to pour your own pint from this system. Um, uh, they did give us a discount code, and they also gave us an affiliate link. You'd have to go to our blog um, to find it, but uh, it's a part of the unboxing post, and it will be a part of this tasting post as well. Thanks for the review. I appreciate uh, all the information. We have other uh, equipment to review as well, which we'll be getting to. So uh, hopefully you've stuck with us throughout this whole video. We appreciate it. Give us a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe to our channel. For John and Mike, BrewDashDudes.com. Brew on. Cheers.